Supreme on the track. You're now tuned in to the Supreme Decisions Legal Minute Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Supreme Decisions Legal Minute Podcast. I'm your host, Supreme Decisions. Now, today I'm actually doing a couple things different here. So the sound might be a little bit noisy in a little for a little while anyway. Because I made a couple of changes and didn't feel like waiting. But today, it's going to be another red pill on qualified immunity. But we're going to use the obviousness standard, which comes from Taylor V. Rojas. And it's R-I-O-J-A-S. Now, sit back, get your popcorn, Get you a sip of yak and grab your notepad, whether it's your iPad or it's actual pen and paper. But tonight, we're actually going to do a little bit of learning. We're going to get into the context of where, again, Supreme Decisions is heading. Because I've been telling you guys I'm going to do different styles of podcasts. I told you guys I'm going to expand on certain things. I actually even told you I'm going back to teaching. Because many of the podcasts I did before were just just rants for the most part. But I gave you information in those rants. I gave you details in those rants. I gave you something. But now it's time for the food. Time to eat. It's time to get down with the get down. So... I'm going to take a brief pause, sip my yak, and then I'm going to get started. And my yak of choice tonight is Hennessy Black, so let's go. Now, most of the time when we're talking about qualified immunity, the thing most of us have very little understanding of. So I'm going to give you a couple of definitions, and I'm going to give you a couple of cases to look at, but... I'm going to start off with qualified immunity protects government officers from being sued for damages unless they violated clearly established law. Now, if you listen to the podcast from last week, I gave you two standards that go into the quote unquote clearly established. But we understand the context of clearly established. I talk about understanding your actual district or circuit courts where your district lies. Those have cases because case law itself, while you have the blanket cases of Terry v. Ohio, uh, Hybel v. Nevada, and Brown v. Board of Education, there are other cases that are done in your circuit that go into underlying cases because no one case encompasses all. That's why I keep telling people law is situational, not subjective. And the great part about law, it's not emotional and it doesn't care about a side. So, what I want you to get into the understanding of is Anderson v. Creighton. 483 U.S. 635 and it's a 1987 case. This is one of the first cases that establishes clearly established law when it comes to the context of qualified immunity because it deals with the holding officers accountable and the ways in which legal doctrines like qualified immunity prevent that from happening. Because most of the time we know about, okay, we have Terry v. Ohio or we have Hybel v. Nevada or we have... Hell, Mills v. D.C. We have those cases, but we don't understand the application of them. And so when we're talking about stripping someone of qualified immunity, a lot of times we'll go and get upset and we'll spend the money to file, uh, uh, um, what do you call that, 
a federal case. Right? And in going in that federal case, we become preoccupied with our feelings. When I just told you that law has no feeling either way. It only cares about itself. So when we're writing it up, we write up things that are unnecessary. We put things in something, because I actually, I actually talk about this. When someone asked me to write up a uh, federal complaint for them, they told me that because it wasn't 20 pages long, it wasn't worthy. It needed to be worthy to be seen. And I asked her, did you just want to say something? If you're, are you paying me to rant or are you paying me to win? Because if you're sending me donations because you want to rant, keep those. Because you can do those. Those are worth your time, not mine. If you're looking to win, that's when you call me. Because I'm going to put in the most effective means for you winning. I'm going to show you the best guidance for your case. And in the context, I'm going to show you the application of clearly established for your situation. I'm going to go through the two steps that's necessary. I'm even going to point out whether the officer's actions were willful or done through ignorance. Because, again, those are the two means in which they lose qualified immunity due to clearly established. And that's why we're going to the obviousness standard. Now, qualified immunity comes under fire from academics such as myself, technically, judges, practitioners, and I guess I fall under that as well, legislators, and the public. Well, I kind of sort of absolutely fall under the public. Alike for unjustly precluding remedies for violations of people's constitutional right. Now, I was actually going to save this one for later, but it was I thought it was rather interesting. Because the reason why I even pulled it up, it was... It was one of those things that kind of kind of threw me because I heard an uh, officer from Arizona state that, oh, I don't work for the people. So I thought that was curious. So one of the things I did, I went and pulled up the Arizona Oath of Office for Police Officers. And what was amazing to me was not only is it codified, I'm going to say that one more time, not only is it codified, but it's something that most of these guys have not, you know, let me go back to something. I tell everybody constantly this, going down the numbers. I cannot remember where I got the numbers from, but I do know it was from a um, university testing this. They, they did the research on this. But the context was less than 10% of people after graduating high school ever read a book again from open to close. And then going through all that 10%, more than 90% of those people never read past the first chapter of a book. I want you to understand what, what, what that means. That does not mean they don't open a book, they don't study. What that means is most people are in college, they're not reading in a book in its entirety. They're studying to regurgitate. That's it. They're not studying to learn. They're studying to be able to repeat. It. That's it. And then once they repeat it, it's gone forever. So they're not actually engaged in what they're actually reading or part of. So, when I talk about people don't read after high school, this is what I'm talking about. This also includes police officers. This also includes judges. This also includes prosecutors. So, when you're asking someone to write something more than eight pages, and yes, I have written, even for myself, a federal lawsuit that went more than eight pages. I have written someone else's lawsuit that was more than eight pages, but only because it was a necessity, because there were so many people, which 
you know, at some point you need to figure out who you're trying to get rid of and go from there. But an example, if I was writing something for um, Tyree Nichols, one, I spoke about eight officers being on the scene. I'm going to go into that because there were more officers that were brought up and we still have one unknown. And then, which actually gave us nine officers, which I didn't see the ninth one, but the three paramedics. But then you have people from the fire department there as well. When you encompass all of those, you have a total of 12 to 15 people that you would be suing in their individual capacity. That is probably going to encompass more than eight pages. So, again, through necessity. But whenever I go through this, I want you to understand something. When you're talking about the oath of office, the Arizona loyalty oath of office, in the oath, the candidate elect or employee solely swears to affirm that they will support the Constitution of the United States. You know those amendments. The book of restrictions that I speak about. And the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona. And defend the U.S. and Arizona against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The states will faithfully and impartially discharge those who are not following suit. Now, that oath of loyalty goes into the Arizona Constitutional Article 6, Section 26, Oath of Office, and goes into peace officers, judges, justices of the peace, and those that are in the judicial and executive branches. Remember, because they're separate. But now, I'm going to go into the police officer's oath. I, they would state their name, do solely swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States. Yes, I did pause for dramatic effect. And the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same and defend them against enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of a peace officer to the best of my ability, so help me God. That is the oath that they swear to or affirm. They sign and file. Both of those documents are what create the living trust for the people. Hence, the fiduciary duty. Why? Because the Constitution of the United States is a trust document for the people, not the government. The Constitution and the laws in the state of Arizona are trust documents, not for the government, but for the people. So if you're going, when they say, oh, well, you're in such and such county, has no no bearing on it because you still fall whether you are a citizen of the United States or not. Let me make that clear because there are a lot of police officers that don't understand the context. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. So whether you are a citizen of the United States or or not, that police officer has a fiduciary duty to you. Because what does the United States Constitution encompass? The following and the observing of the Geneva Convention, which are treaties that the United States itself are part of. That's why you have diplomats. That's why you have nationals. That's why you have all these other incomes, even those that experience expatriation where they become in, in legal terms stateless. They still fall under the Constitution of the United States of America. They still fall under that. Understand that. So when you say you are supporting the Constitution of the United States, did you lie to yourself or are you lying to God? Because that's what you are swearing or affirming to. 
So when you say you, I don't work for you, or you're worrying about what county I live in, or what state I, it doesn't matter. Because I'm still human. And if you want to upset people that are in the government, refer to yourself as human when they ask you your race. See how upset they get. Because if you're not cattle, or as they say, chattel, you're a problem. You're doing things that, that's, that's unnecessary. Why, why are we even going through this? Because they want to look at you as something less than human. Because it's easier. Because even whenever I talk about this, because I'm even going to start uploading videos to YouTube for the master class, because I want you to understand something. I put up a video that dealt with one thing, and it was funny because the context of humanizing yourself is something that most people have no idea about because only good defense attorneys implement it. I'm going to say that one more time. Humanizing. Whenever they tell you, I want, I want to humanize my client. I want to put him on a shirt and tie. I want to make him look presentable. I want to make her look presentable. I want to make sure they refer, because even George Zimmerman used the tactic. If you remember, the jurors called it, well, well, George felt this. George felt that. Guess what they could not say in my trial because I put in emotional limiting. They couldn't call me anything other than Richard. They didn't have to say my whole name. They had to call me Richard. Every time they referred to me, they had to refer to me as Richard. Why? Because I understand that I am the most powerful person in the courtroom. Say my name. Humanize me. I am not a defendant. I am not a nameless thing that's on a sheet of paper. My name is Richard. That was the name that my father gave me. That was the name that my mother thought of when I was in her womb. Call me Richard. Because I am human. And when you understand the context of that. So when they're saying, oh, I don't do that. Understand. Even these duties as a fiduciary... They are amenable to you at all times. Now, I didn't see it in the Arizona um, Constitution. It is plainly written in the Georgia Constitution. And if you actually start to begin or actually begin to study trust law, you understand the fiduciary is amenable to the beneficiary at all times. Now, I can keep going through with these English sessions, but I, I just wanted to get that up because most people don't even catch that. Because that's not something we're taught. Because we're taught, oh, they have power. They're abusing power. How do they get it? How does a servant become more powerful than a master? How does that happen? They volunteer to be servants. They volunteer to give them themselves and discharge impartially and faithfully their duties. Yet, when you question them on it, when you challenge them on it, when you offer correction on it, it's a problem. Because it's even codified in the Arizona Organic Code. 38-231. Officers and employees are required to take a loyalty oath. The form, the classification, and the definition. Section 8, in order to ensure the statewide application of this section on a uniform basis, meaning everyone, each board, each commission, agency, or independent office of the state, and in any of the political subdivisions and any county, city, town, municipality, school district, and public educational institution, shall completely reproduce. This section, so that the form of written oath or affirmation required in this section contains all of the provisions of this section for use by all officers and employees on all boards, commissions, agencies, and independent offices. Say that again, because most of us don't understand the context. 
The government has no power except that of which you give them. It's not an option for them to take an oath. That is actually their duty. So when they're choosing, when they're choosing not to do it, it's a violation because they are no longer actors of the government. But you have to understand that. And even going through this, Taylor B. Rojas, correctional officers, because remember I talked about any board and use of all officers, employees of all boards, commissions, and agencies, even independent officers, because we understand the context of privatized prisons. So the correctional officers, the correctional officers in our private prisons have now the ability to be sued. Now, getting videos is a different thing because you're probably going to have to have contraband to get it, but it's still possible. Because correctional officers were not entitled to qualified immunity because the conditions of confinement alleged by the petitioner were so horrific that any reasonable officer should have known they were unconstitutional. This is where the obviousness, the obviousness standard comes in. Goodness, might need to slow down a little bit. Might need to take me a old sip of yak. Let me hold on for a second. Let me. Yeah, I was a little parched. Because everybody knows I'm from Georgia. I talk about how Georgia is now under the DOJ's um, worst condition prisons in the country. Followed very closely by Alabama, Mississippi, and Arizona. Arizona actually has a twofer. Because they're the most violent police force in the country. Followed by California and Georgia. <laughs> You know, in, in New York, you know, can't, can't leave those guys out. But when you're understanding context, Young Thug, I actually, you know, had brought this up. His attorney did not push it like I thought he would. But one of the things he could have used or could have looked to was Taylor B. Ross. And understanding the prison conditions and the application of the obviousness rule, the application of clearly established falls with Young Thug because he talked about the Gwinnett County um, jail conditions. Now, I'm going I'm to I'm go back a little bit. I'm going to date myself. I'm not sure who all had an opportunity to see the movie Belly. Well, those who did see the movie Belly 20 years ago the jail, when DMX was in, when he was in Atlanta, was the old DeKalb County jail system. It was a holding, that was jail. That was actually a jail. That was the old one. It was literally across the street from the new one. I had an opportunity to spend time in both of them. They were both deplorable. I then went to a place like Clayton County. Clayton County was super overcrowded. Even Rice Street. Most people have no clue how horrible Rice Street was because the feds had one point in the, I want to say early 2000s, took over Rice Street because it was so deplorable. Because the clearly established and the obviousness rule was the fact that it was so filthy in there. No one should be, because I want, I want you to understand something. Just because you're in a jail cell does not mean you are guilty of a crime. 90% of people that are in these jail cells have not even gone to court yet. They haven't even been convicted. So to that's why it's illegal, clearly established, to subject someone to felonious conditions absent a conviction. So when you're putting people in these deplorable conditions, they haven't been convicted of a crime, and, you know, it's filthy. You know, it, who's supposed to live in this? 
these things would be obviously wrong because I always tell people here's here's because I actually had a CO and it was amazing. I'm gonna get to him in a second, but it it amazes me. They'll talk trash when they're on one side of the door, but they forget that it's simplicity that got you on that side. I was actually taken to jail one that look like, notice what I just I was actually taken to jail for a registration violation. And it was just simply a clerical error. I went to jail, had to bond out the whole nine for a clerical error. But the simplicity of a clerical error got me in jail. Did that make me a criminal? In the eyes of most people, it absolutely does. There were other instances that should have gotten me in jail that didn't. Those made me a criminal. But I weren't, wasn't convicted of those acts. But here's, here's, here's the thing I want to give you. When you're simply addressing someone because of an idea or a thought, that doesn't make it so. So when you're looking at this and you say, oh, well, this guy was convicted of that. Go to the FBI website and look up the fact that a police officer who is not trained properly gets it wrong 75% of the time. And then you look at the people being released on death row. Most of them are being put there because they don't have someone that's properly fighting for them. And there is lack of evidence in a lot of these cases. Or it's police misconduct. Now, am I saying there are no criminals? Absolutely not. But what I'm saying is understand before you place judgment. And you place someone else on a pedestal for an act that you have no idea what it is. You might want to get the information first. Because that information may enlighten you to the things that are actually available to you. But going back, going back, because I almost went off on a tangent a little bit. But going back, qualified immunity permits damages liability for violations for such settled rules. While discouraging plaintiff's lawyers from bringing a wide variety of novel damages claims of questionable merit, because again, we talk about the police mistakes, the police misconducts, those that, because you remember I talked about doing what we are trained to do, they, they, the qualified immunity test is set up to deter you from even acting. And it also minimizes the cost that would be incurred by innocent third parties if public officials face unlimited liability. Now, the one thing that a lot of people didn't like was the fact that I read the Police Reform Act. I read it from cover to cover. And the reason why you don't see people see it on the ballot, which was actually interesting to me, if it ever goes to ballot, it's going to lose. Because 59% of likely voters responded that they either somewhat or strongly supported the end of qualified immunity. Because even in the context, you look at the young lady from Fort Worth. Her neighbor called and said, hey, you know, it's, it's kind of late. My, my neighbor had a party and her front door is wide open. I don't see anybody moving around in the house. I just want to make sure everything's okay. Called on a non-emergency line. Didn't call 911. Called on a non-emergency line. Police officers pulled up as if there was a bank robbery. No lights, no sirens. They parked down the street. One police officer, before he could finish saying, freeze, shot and killed her through a window. Just, just imagine that. And I talked about 120 people being killed by police officers for non-crimes or non-violent crimes. 
basically where the people are unarmed, or just like the young man today, he was murdered for shoplifting. When we watch people take thousands and thousands and thousands upon thousands of goods from business owners, basically hurting themselves. Those people walked out unscathed. This young man, he stole, I believe he stole sunglasses. He was shot in the chest twice. The police then lied. And then now a video comes up and it's like, oops. But it's always remarkable how we put police on a pedestal, right? And then we talk about how great they are, how dangerous the job is. And then we come to find out that most of them are not very educated. Most of them are lying, and all of them are using stock language. Had a young man that was killed picking up his brother. He wrote in his paperwork that the guy jumped out of his car and headbutted him in the nose. Then a video comes out. He was actually sitting down in the car relaxed until the officer began to badger him. You know, escalate the situation when there was a non-violent crime. In fact, the report was that he had gotten into somebody else's car. Basically what it was, two people, they're going to pick up their kids, same car. He's not paying attention, he's on his phone. You know, the average person. He has anxiety. So when the officer tells him to empty his pockets, he does just that. You know, because they say, if you're not doing anything, all you have to do is comply. So he was doing that. He pulls out one of his anti-anxiety medicines. He had a pill. Pops it in his mouth. Why? Because the police officers are creating anxiety because they are now antagonizing him. They ask him, hey, what did you put in your mouth? He says, I put in my pill. After he had previously told me he has anxiety, he popped the pill. Now, I get that they need to restrain him. Hold on, bro. We don't, we don't know what pill you put in your mouth. I get it. I get that. But then to shoot him on the ground three times and say, we immediately rendered him aid. But then when the video comes out, the story changes to we were afraid for our lives. They were so afraid that they were standing there and they lied. They were so afraid that they were tucking their shirts in. But these are the acts they don't want to be held responsible for. Yet they are clearly established. You know what? Let me, let me get back to this because I'll go out and I'm blacked out and cut this off. But Taylor B. Rojas overturned a grant of qualified immunity based on the obviousness of the constitutionality violation. Let me get another sip because I got I to gotta get back right. Hold on. That decision sends a message to lower courts that they cannot ignore the obviousness standard. Now, is the obviousness standard actually uh, pretty much the, the, that that nail. No, absolutely not. Because what we're going to go back to is Jordan B. City of Prince. Police officers are not very intelligent. So what's obvious to you may not be obvious to them because they're doing what they are trained to do. They're not asking questions because that's not their mental mind state. They're doing what they're trained to do. So whenever I yell, oh, they're trained to tackle, they're doing what they're trained to do. So when I watch the actions of a police officer shooting someone three times that's unarmed and had no threat and yelling, oh, he went for my gun. You know, the stop language. I was in fear for my life. That's why I shot him three times. We have to go to cases like Zadea v. Robinson. That was in the Fifth Circuit in 2018. Because 
that was one of the reinforcements of the obviousness of constitutionality standard. We have to use those. Those were certain parts of that case applies in the context of the obviousness standard. Because that goes now into the clearly established, because again, this hasn't first started. Because remember, I even talked about the apprehend. We're using the guns to apprehend, but you have seven other non-lethal. And your first duty is the preservation of life. But yet, the first action is to take a life. So when I talk about it, and I even said last week, we're either creating cowards or we're creating killers. If you have seven other avenues of keeping someone alive and your first mind is to go to killing someone, you're either a coward or or kill, but then it goes back to the poem I read once because again, a lot of people don't understand. I say things that plant seeds. The hunting of a man is never more wanted than a man who has done it previously. When I talked about the Arizona Police Department, I talked about sixty-five percent of them had been in police shootings. Of that 65%, 75% of them had been in multiple shootings. Talked about Wayne Jenkins. He had been in 10 police-involved shootings. 10. The average is two. That's the average. Like, that is, like, and that's high. Because they talk about many officers go their entire career without pulling out their gun. He had pulled it out and shot it 10 times. The hunting of a man. Because that's what it is. That's why it's predatory. That's why you have those that have that mentality. Because I'm not going to ask any questions. I don't want anyone that can decipher and make judgments. I want someone that's just going to act. They're using them as weapons. That's why you have these Karens that call them because they're weaponizing the police and the police are welcoming the weaponizing. That's why there's no correction because if they wanted to correct it, if they didn't want to be used as weapons, there are actually laws on the book that they can enforce in every state. It's called filing a false report. But they like to be weapons. They like to be utilized as weapons because they want to be feared. They don't want anyone to be okay with the actions that they're doing. They want them to be feared. Because even when I talked about some of the stuff that I'm going to do, people don't say, oh, well, man, you shouldn't do that because people aren't going to like you. You know what they say? You better watch out because the cops are coming. You know, the blue gang. Oh, excuse me, I, I misspoke. The blue wall, you know, but they have separation on what color is the wall. Because it has the, the police, fraternal police order of African Americans, the fraternal police order of Asian Americans, fraternal police order of Hispanic Americans, but what color is the wall? Because even in that wall, they have separation of color. Even in that wall, they say, okay, yeah, we care about your mental health, yet they don't allow you to get mental health help. They spend more money on bad cops than they do on the mental health of any cop. I'm going to say that one more time. They spend more money on bad cops, making sure they're continuing to stay on the street, than they do on the mental health of any cops. Highest suicide rates, cops. Highest domestic violence rates, cops. Highest cop shootings. Cops. There's news for you. Most people didn't even know that. More cops are killed by cops than they are anybody else. Did you know that? And again, those that don't believe me, FBI has a website. Go check it out. Nobody 
is worrying about correcting police officers because doing the corrections means aiming the weapon somewhere else. They don't want you to be better. And I'm talking to cops right now. They don't want you to be better. They don't want you to be good. They want you to be hated. They want you to be feared. They want you to be weapons. That's why they don't want you to refer to people as humans. That's why they tell you that everybody you encounter is trying to hurt you. That's why it's reinforced and hammered home. Home, bang, bang. But everybody wants to hurt you. Boom, boom. Nobody likes you. Boom, boom, boom. Everybody's trying to kill you. That's why you got to be fast. Damn that taser. Damn that baton. Damn them, them rubber bullets. You got to light that ass up. Run around like a bunch of Tupacs and juice. But then you wonder why it's the hate you earn. It ain't the hate you give. It's the hate you're earning. Every time we watch an officer walk after murdering someone and lying about it, because again, if they were good people, if they were doing the right thing, why are you lying about it? Yeah, don't adjust the radio. I did pause for dramatic effect because I wanted to offer you an opportunity to think about that. And that's for the police apologists. Because it amazes me. All those that, that well, the police are this, the police, oh my God, you shouldn't talk about the police. But when I ask those questions, people become combative. Because what happens is now I'm forcing you to think. I'm forcing you to be real. I'm forcing you to change. Because it's easy to sit up here and talk about it. It is not easy to be about it. Understanding the context, because even the, even in the in the let me calm down a little bit, because you know I you know I got to get I, I get emotional about I you know I put my heart on the paper. Even in the context of understanding the totality of circumstances, the reaffirming. And even the new information most of us are getting becomes painful because it goes against the very programming that we have been given our life throughout its entirety. Because now we have to look at you different. Not because we want to, but because we have to, because that's what the information says. The information tells me to look at you different. The circumstance tells me to look at you differently. But it also requires me to look at you. I look at Instagram. And I, I, I even watch myself because I'm, I'm guilty of it as well. I put certain things online because it's, a, it's an image I'm trying to project. It's something I'm trying to give you. If you want to know about me, here's what I'm going to give you. But in the context of that, is it really me? Well, I'm going to give it to you in my young Jeezy voice. The reason why people can't assassinate my character is because I'm not acting. It's the same thing I told John Melvin. You can't assassinate my character because I'm not acting. You can call me whatever name you want to in the paper, but the people that know me, know me. The greatest part about that, the police officer that arrested me, the detective that arrested me, when he saw me, because again, I'm anti-government according to John Melvin. This police officer who arrested me, I, I, have to, I have to lay that down on you. When he saw me in the courtroom, well, actually, he saw me in the courthouse, he ran literally. He ran and jumped into my arms and gave me a hug. But I'm anti-government. I'm anti-police. This police officer even looked me in the eye after giving me a hug and said, hey, man, I appreciate you because the information you gave me helped me and it allowed me to sleep at night because he was being sued. He was not the leader of a task force that went into the wrong house. 
He was not the one who had gotten the warrant. Yet, the one who had gotten the warrant put everything on him. I gave him a means of getting out. Why? Because his lawyer was, oh, you know, the defense. Because they were going to let him be guilty of something he wasn't guilty of. Remember when I talked about the young lady last week? The police officer said, she didn't do it. She ain't the person we're looking for. Yet, they accused her of being a felon as an excuse for shooting her in the back twice. But again, these are good people. Why would they lie? Why would they just make things up? Or why are they so oblivious to the lies they're telling? But then when we talk about them getting away with certain things that they are guilty of and we're watching it, these are the means of why I'm giving you the qualified immunity red pills. This is why I'm talking about the correctional officers because now this is where I'm about to give you something. Because I've, I've given the story of the officer that arrested me and kicked me in the head and my my uh, not finest moment when I seen him afterwards. Because again, it's it's going to get it's going to give a little bit of light, right? There. So I'm in Coastal. Those that have been to prison in Georgia know what Coastal is. I'm about to come home. It's a little guard. I I think he was about five four. Old man. But he never came on the block with any other officer. It was him by himself all the time. When he spoke to us, he's, yes, sir. No, sir. Uh, Let me see if I can get that for you, sir. He sounded like a waiter. So when we were leaving and we were, you know, he was doing a head count. My my cellmate, we called him B.I.S. Biaza leaned up and said, hey, hey, CO, why do you talk to us like that? CO turns around. He said, I want y'all to understand something. Y'all not going to be in here forever. And I go to the grocery store. And then he walked off. But the context and the mindset was, y'all are still human. Y'all are Y'all are leaving. This is a temporary home for you. He didn't look at us as anything less than humans. He treated us as humans. He was very professional doing his job. And we, you know what? These hardened criminals that was in prison allowed him to do it unscathed. Isn't that amazing? When you treat people as humans. <laughs> when you do the job professionally. And keep in mind, the dorm I was in was called the Thunderdome because we stayed into something. There was always a fight. We was constantly dragging people to the door. Folks were going in and out of the infirmary from that dorm. It was called the Thunderdome. This officer was unscathed. Any other officer came in there, they came in there in twos and threes. He always came by himself. Other officers talk to us like trash, beat on the door, acted all ignorant because they didn't realize we not here forever. This cage isn't for animals. But I, I want you to understand this. I was in this 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 holding cell in in Augusta and it was called 401 at the time. 401 had two man cells. They had four to five men per cell on any given day. They were slow to get you to court. And the water the most of the toilets were backed up, the sewage was backed up, and this was even just me being there one night. These were the things I... And most of the COs, the correctional officers, thought it was funny. Oh, you got locked up. Oh, you got to sleep in black. It was cool. But here's where the obviousness standard comes in at. 
if we were humans, would you want your wife to lay in there? Would you want your husband? Would you want your child laying in there? Would you want your mama, daddy? Because, see, I don't know who's been good to you. I don't know who you love. But would you have a loved one in that? Would you have a loved someone you loved in that condition? No matter what they, would you have them in that? Is it okay for that? That's the question. When is it okay for that with you? Are you willing to be in that condition? See, I, and those are the things that I want to point out, especially when I'm talking about the obviousness standard. Because if it's not good enough for you, what makes it good enough for anyone else? But I'm 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 gonna I'm go on because I, I just want to leave that with you. Correction officers kept Taylor in a pair of disturbingly unsanitary cells for six days. Remember, I just talked about four one, the unsanitary conditions. Now, the first cell, not me, this is Taylor, was covered in. Massive amounts of feces. Basically, it was a bunch of shit on the floor, literally. And the waste on the floor, walls, and windows even packed inside the water faucet. So there was literally shit everywhere. And I mean that in the best contents. Taylor couldn't eat or drink anything for four days. Now, one of the things I learned in prison was the simple fact that if you do not eat... In Georgia, they will put you in the hole. The hole is solitary confinement. There are no windows. It's just a door. And literally, when I laid on the floor, my feet and arms, I could touch the door and the wall of the back of my cell. And if I spread my arms out, I could touch those two walls. So I was literally in a box. Literally, where I could touch all four walls if I laid on the floor. Almost simultaneously. But that space I lived in for 14 months. That was a space I had for 14 consecutive months. Well, actually, I shouldn't say consecutive because it was like 60-day intervals. But I refused to eat. And the context of this is Taylor had a fear that his food or water would be contaminated. Myself, I was not eating anything that wasn't wrapped up. It got even to the point to where I only ate what the guards ate. So if somebody, and you know, I'm, I'm going to throw this out there too, because in, in my last marriage, I actually refused to allow my, my then wife cook. She would not cook. I didn't trust her. And if she did cook, I fed my oldest son first. And she asked me one day, she was like, why do you do that? I said, you'll kill everybody in this house, but you won't kill him. So if you're trying to poison me, you're killing him. Because I don't trust people like that. I'm not just willy-nilly with my life. But it's understanding the context. He had a fear that his food would be contaminated. I wasn't even going to chance it. But again, that landed me in the hole. That landed him in a second filthy-ass cell. His second cell was extremely cold and lacked a bed and a toilet. Now, I've had an experience similar to this one in DeKalb County, the new hotel. In DeKalb County, they put us on a bunk with no cover, and the bed itself is metal. And one of the things they do to quote-unquote torture you is to make the cells extremely uncomfortable and cold. You don't have any cover to warm up with. Even in the Alabama um, lawsuit a couple weeks ago, they were literally cooking inmates. Georgia had one where they actually froze an inmate to death. It was not DeKalb County. Let me let me throw that out there because I'm, I'm bashing them. But again, but again, I'm talking about the deplorable places. But I go back to the context of humanizing. It's something you do whenever you're working out the ideals of becoming innocent or showing people. Because it's difficult to convict a human. If they see you as human, it's difficult to convict you. If you're a defendant, 
you just that other bastard that did something. Cause they a defendant broke into their house. A defendant killed their mama. A defendant did something to somebody. But a George or a Richard, well, those are people from work. Those are good guys. Those are the ones that are at the house. Because you can't leave a George or Richard in filth and think it's okay. You can't leave someone that you love in filth or in dire cold and it be okay. Because you see them as human. So when we're talking about the obviousness standard, always remember, I stated years ago, police officers are the fiduciary. They're your fiduciary. And they're responsible for your well-being while you are in their custody. Why? Because officer discretion. They're making a conscious choice to put you in those conditions. That's why they have to give you medical. That's why they have to make sure you are healthy. That's why they have to make sure you are mentally stable to stay in trial. That's why they have to do these things. Because of officer discretion. Because of their responsibility. Because Taylor was ultimately treated for a distended bladder and catheterized for holding his urine because in the second cell... There was overflow. His toilet was clogged. So he went from filth and shit being everywhere to now he's got piss and shit everywhere and it's clogged up and it's cold. So he can't use the bathroom and he's not eating. Distended bladder, catheterized. And Taylor brought a civil rights action against the correctional officers under 42 USC 1983. He referred to the deliberate indifference to his health and safety in violation of the Eighth Amendment. Now, let me read the Eighth Amendment to you because I know a lot of people have no clue of what that actually means. And I'll give you context to the prior statements that I made. Eighth Amendment is a restriction on excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. So leaving someone to live in feces. Leaving someone in dire cold with no bed, no cover, and a clogged toilet and sink with overflowing human waste. Those are obvious, right? Should be. But that would also be cruel and unusual punishment. Because that's not a normal thing to do. Nor is baking someone in an outside incinerator in, in a, a metal box in Arizona, but, you know, it's done. The, though the law was clear that prisoners cannot be housed in cells teeming with human waste for months on end, there still had to be a secondary thing. Because remember, I talk about there are two applications for proving a 1983. There are two applications for proving or disproving the qualified immunity. There are only two means. For, so again, there are steps to this. There's a process to each one of these. Because in Davis v. Scott, the court held that an inmate being confined to a cell with blood and feces for three days didn't violate the Constitution. I'm going to say that again. An inmate in Davis v. Scott being confined in a cell with blood and feces for three days didn't violate the Constitution. But I also want you to understand this. Understand our judicial system because I'm going to get into that. 8,400, excuse me, 840,000 people that are currently in our prison system have not been convicted of a crime. When I talk about deplorable conditions and I use the entire state of Georgia and I use the entire state 
of Mississippi. I use the entire state of Alabama. I use the entire state of Arizona. I use these because they are the worst of the worst. Not because of the people there, but because of the conditions. The reason why the DOJ aren't shutting them down is because just enough is okay. Because people haven't even figured out the difference of being in jail and being in prison. Those are definitely two different places. Most people haven't even figured that out. But understand this. The fair warning that their specific acts were unconstitutional. Clearly established. They used the context of fair warning in this instance. So when they're throwing these people into these places. They're just doing what they are trained to do. Because they're not asking any questions. But when we talk about it, because many of you probably have had to turn this off and turn it back on just to get the context of living in feces. Being literally frozen. And understanding the alleged facts should be sufficient to show a constitutional violation. Clearly established that it is unconstitutional to deprive inmates of minimally sanitary way to relieve themselves for a period of 17 hours, leaving them no choice but to sleep in their own ways should be part of the obviousness standard. Should be. But again, just like I said earlier, my form of obvious may not be the police officer's form of, or the correctional officer's form of obvious. Now, in Arenas v. Calhoun, and again in the Fifth Circuit in 2019, to show a violation of the Eighth Amendment on a conditions of confinement claim. Now, I, I'm going to stop right here. Young Thug's attorney, Georgia is under a DOJ lawsuit and investigation. Arenas v. Calhoun. It's a Fifth Circuit case, 2019. It is clearly established to show a violation of the Eighth Amendment on a conditions of confinement claim. The plaintiff must show not only the conditions denied him the minimal civilized measures of life's necessities and expose him to a substantial risk of human harm, but that the officer was deliberately indifferent to the harm, which means they did nothing to eradicate it or to correct it or to make it livable. Because in Huddle v. Finney, 1978, clearly established, which has instructed that a filthy overcrowded cell, just like I talked about, 401, might be tolerable for a few days in intolerable cruelty for weeks or months. I'm going to say that one more time because there were a lot of people housed at 401. A filthy, overcrowded cell might be tolerable for a few days. An intolerable cruel for months or weeks. Hutto v. Finney, clearly established, 1978. That even goes for private prisons. These are the things that I'm trying to give you. Even New York, Ohio, Illinois, they go into the overcrowded standard. So again, those places, if you're there, that needs to be something that you are researching, that you are placing your bets on. Or when you're calling me, that's the conversation we need to have. Because any reasonable officer should have realized that Taylor's condition of confinement offended the Constitution. And following Hope B. Pelzer, the obviousness of the conditions of the cell for days on end was unconstitutional. Davis, as to dissimilar to provide on-point precedent. The reason why we talk about that, because again, I talk about the different aspects of Terry v. Ohio. 
this is an example of when I speak about law being situational, not subjective. Because a couple days, a eh, couple of weeks, uh-uh. When we're talking about Davis, we're talking about the reasonable corrections officers would have known their conduct was unconstitutional and the case law stating that holding a prisoner in a filthy cell for a few days might be tolerable was not to the contrary since Taylor's cell were not just unpleasant. They were the filthiest cells imaginable. They were obvious. You literally have feces on the floor, on the wall, from the windows to the wall. Literally. The cell was part of the yin yang twins. From the windows to the wall to the floor. To, you know what? I'm going to keep moving because I almost, I almost said something. But I want you to understand that. The simplest of facts are correction officers do not have the freedom of thought. Now, am I giving am I giving you something? Because I already talked about they're not very intelligent. But when I talk about correction officers, they're a different beast. But they don't have the freedom of thought. These are literally order takers. This becomes something easy to show because most prisoners of jails have someone posting on Instagram or Facebook. While they're incarcerated. Because remember I just told you. I was in prison. I was eating with the guards. Were eating. Why? Because. I'm a likable guy I guess. They wanted to help me. I even gave stock tips. I, I, I just want you to understand. I even gave stock tips. So they were helping me eat. Because, again, I wasn't eating anything that wasn't wrapped up because I didn't trust anybody. But the obviousness standard is established in hope to overturn a grant of qualified immunity. Qualified immunity, again, protects government officers from damages and suits unless their conduct violates clearly established constitutional rights for which a reasonable person would have known. In order to overcome the qualified immunity defense, a plaintiff must show both that the officer's conduct violated the plaintiff's constitutional rights and their rights were clearly established at the time of the violation. Remember, I told you it was only two. Qualified immunity. Boom. Drop that. And then we go on to the next part. Choice. Officer. Discretion. A willful act. Or they're doing it through ignorance. Because they have a fiduciary duty to the public. Get a copy of the Oprah Office. Just like I just read to you. This is to establish that duty. The part of the duty is that's supposed to support. And defend the Constitution of the United States. And the U.S. Collective. Supreme Court cases show clearly established. Enrich. The chance of your winning. And it's all done because they have to sign it and they have to file it. Because understanding, a right is clearly established if there is precedent. Terry v. Ohio. Usually in the form of case law. Terry v. Ohio. This is the meaning of situational, not subjective. A right is clearly established if there is precedent. Usually in the form of case law. Articulating that right and thereby putting the officer on notice that his or her conduct is also putting them on notice. Now, 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 now I'm going to say something. I got to because one of the things my, my people love to tell me, well, I, I, well, I have to put you on notice. Well, I'm going to need you to stay focused because what we're doing this is a process to putting that officer on notice that his or her conduct was unlawful. There's a procedure to doing it. Everything you do has a process. Trust the process. And what's funny is I was watching Law and Order. That's one of my favorite shows. And while I was watching, I was watching with one, of, one of my cop buddies. And he starts laughing. And I'm like, okay, cool. What's, what's, what's the business? And he goes, 
He said, it's funny because you're an enigma. And I was like, how? How am I an enigma? He said, because the way you speak, people perceive you as a cop hater. I said, okay. You know, that's not new. That's pretty much what they say. He said, but you are a true believer. You actually do believe in our system as it's currently written. And I was like, absolutely, because it's not written for innocent people. I've said it once, I've said it twice, I've said it a thousand times. Our current policing system is not designed for innocent people. Because even the cops are criminals. And they have no idea they're doing what they're trained to do is actually doing it unlawfully. Their actual training is the problem. Because again, I talk about Georgia. Six weeks of training. 80% of the class should not, have, should not be graduating. It's done in six weeks. Worst place in the United States to actually be a police officer. Even Sergeant Inman, who's training people, showed you the clear violations that she's even willing to do as a Richmond County police officer, as a Richmond County police sergeant, and think it's okay. While we come into El Paso, the safe city in America, whose police training is 12 months. Lowest crime in America per capita. Yeah, I wanted, you, wanted that to sink in because I wanted to give you the idea of who cares about their people. Police that are being trained for 12 months, safest city in America. <laughs> police officers trained for six weeks. Who 80% shouldn't. There's an entire police class of Georgia State Patrol that was caught cheating. An entire class was like, yep, we're going to disband them. And then they rehired 34, I believe it was 34 of them. I actually have a story out in a little bit. But they actually rehired 34 cops that were caught cheating. They rehired 34 people who couldn't pass a test. And then you wonder why they're the worst state in the country. Don't worry, I'll let that sink in. The court has typically required that this precedent define the right at a particularized level so that the officer can reasonably anticipate where their conduct may have given rise to the liability for damages. It is not sufficient that the Fourth Amendment protects from unreasonable search and seizure. There must be a precedent showing the specific circumstances of a particular search were unconstitutional. <clears throat> and even when I'm talking about this, learn your circuit courts and their cases because some circuits only consider their own case law. Because officers can still be on notice that their conduct violates established law even in novel factual circumstances. Officers needed fair warning that a violation could be so obvious that general constitutional principles already expressed in precedent could suffice to give the officers warning that their conduct was unconstitutional. But again, that's part of the obviousness standard. But remember, the obviousness standard isn't in or hasn't been decided on or established country or circuit-wide, every circuit court. Because a lot of circuit courts use the beyond debate standard. Right? <clears throat> the beyond debate standard will stand in Lemieux v. Um, Luna. And it's a right to be established beyond the debate. That's why you have these cases like Hybel v. Nevada. That's why you have Terry v. Ohio. Because it's not able to debate those. Right? And most aren't because they are not people who ask questions. <clears throat> they don't make decisions and accept mimicking those that are training them. Hence, doing what we are trained to do. By nature, most COs are followers. Even by nature, most police officers are followers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me get a little sip of this yak. Let it sink in a little bit on you. Ah. <sighs> 
Yes, sir. That Hennessy Black is beautiful. You need to get you some. And I actually need to talk to Hennessy about getting a check. Anyway, what happens is when we talk about Terry v. Ohio, everyone knows the pre pretext of that case. The beyond reasonable doubt standard is the forced ID. They can't just force you to ID. That's why you have Davis v. Mississippi. I actually put that on TikTok a couple days ago. Police can't give instructions absent a crime. I actually put that up years ago because that's called a show of authority stop. That's actually been supported in every circuit. And the right to remain silent, as in Florida v. Royer, and the right to participate in a police investigation. These are things that are established not only with those cases, <clears throat> but those are beyond debate cases. Those are not cases that are just going to be swept under the rug because you've written them down, but it's understanding when and how they apply to that situation. Now, understand, police officers released a police dog without warning onto a man who had been sitting motionless with his hands in the air. That is part of the obviousness standard. But it also understands that declared it unconstitutional for an officer to release an inadequately trained police dog without warning onto two suspects who were not fleeing. That's called excessive force. Because I even did a video about obtaining the records of not only the officer, but the certifications of the dog. Because when you're challenging every aspect of an arrest, every element that they have to prove, and you're challenging it, these are the aspects what you do. Because again, I even talked about Georgia. If you don't do it properly the first time, you cannot get a second shot at the apple in your appeal. You can't even bring it up in appeal. Because you have to set it, you have to put the foundation down first. You want to build a house, you got to put the foundation down. If the foundation is trash, guess what? The house is not going to stand. But that's why I give you the things I give you when I give them to you. But also, when I'm giving you something, I'm giving you something in order to win. I'm giving you stuff that gives you an, a fighting chance. Because not having this direction, not having these ideals, not being able to understand. Because I know the more I speak about this, the more I put this stuff together for you, the more sense I make from videos I did five years ago. Because a lot of people, well, that, 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 that's not right. That's not, that, I didn't see that. Didn't ask you to. Because I actually watched a video a couple days ago and it was beautiful. And, that, and here's my answer for those who say, I didn't see that. Pastor was on stage. He said, sometimes when God is doing something for you that you can't see, it's because he's doing something for you that you can't see. And the reason why I'm giving you things and you're saying you can't see it is because it's not time for you to see it. You still think there's a spoon. I'll let you catch up on that one. But requiring prisoners to live in unsanitary conditions is unconstitutional. When you're putting together your case, when you're put, putting your, you know, when you're putting your complaints together, because this is one thing I constantly have to tell people, one is stay focused. What you have to understand when you're doing or applying your specificity, you're doing materially similar facts applying to a specific case law. That's what makes it situational, not subjective. Because even in the United States being linear, officials can still be on notice that their conduct violates the status law even if novel factual circumstances. Arguably, the violation was so obvious that our Eighth Amendment cases gave respondents fair warning that their conduct violated the Constitution. Regardless in the light of blinding 11th Circuit President, we readily conclude that the respondent's conduct violated clearly established statutory or constitutional rights which a reasonable person would have known. So even in the application, even with the notice, 
there's still something else. And you remember I, I literally said that probably about 20 minutes ago. There are things that you have to layer out. These are the things that most people miss because they become entangled because they're too close to the situation. They don't know how to separate themselves from the actual... They can't separate themselves from the pain. That's why you call me. They can't see what they're looking at because they still have pain in their eyes. I'm the surgeon that's operating on you. I just need to care about the operation being successful. You need to care about trusting me to do my job. Allow me to do what it is that you call me to do. When you shoot me the email, allow me to do what it is that you're asking me to do. Because even understanding that one that held that handcuffing inmates to cells or princes for long periods of time was unconstitutional. But here's the great part about it. What is a long period of time? Because I constantly have people arguing with me about um, Sharp v. U.S. 20 minutes is too long for a stop. Because they'll argue with me about statutes, codes, and ordinances. But when I'm talking to you about actual law. I'm talking about clearly established. Because there's, oh, well, we can allow roadblocks, but then I'll give you Delaware v. Prowse. I don't have to give you my ID. I'll give you Hybel v. Nevada. I don't have to give you my ID. But then when we go into depth about the roadblock itself, I give you Mills v. District of Columbia. Because all of these are subjective. But when I'm being specific, and I'm talking about clearly established, I'm going situational with those cases. And those cases put you on notice. Because physical abuse of a prisoner when he is no longer resisting authority, such as denying him water, would be unconstitutional. That's part of the obvious standard. When you're saying someone headbutt you in the mouth and they didn't and broke your nose, or someone's reaching for your gun and they didn't and you shoot them three times and they're unarmed. When you say, oh, he reached in his pocket, I didn't know what he was doing when the officer had told him to reach in his pocket and get his stuff out. Those are lies. Those are clearly established constitutional violations. That is why they lie, because they know if you actually knew the truth, they become liable but then what happens there's not a bunch of me running around telling you how to do it the right way there are a bunch of people saying yeah you got to file a 1983 but they don't know how to do it or they don't know how to do it and when they're not a bunch of turner v drivers there's not a bunch of hybel v nevadas there's a reason for that you have to understand there are context. There's a process to this. Because even the Department of Justice reports specifically advising that Alabama Department of Corrections that its practices were unconstitutional. Put a reasonable officer on notice that their conduct was unlawful. So, Department of um, Justice, their report puts all Alabama Department of Corrections that their practices were unconstitutional. So that is still in effect today. Department of Justice reports for Georgia, their officers' actions are unconstitutional. That puts them on notice. So if someone wants to, the young lady who did the video, wants to hold Sergeant Inman of Richmond County responsible for forcing her way into her house, after she said that there was no imminent danger, after she said that there was no warrant, after she said there was no opportunity for escape, there was no damage to evidence. You know, Officer Inman said that. Sergeant, excuse me, Sergeant Inman of the Richmond County Police Department said that. You can now hold her responsible. Why? Because she's already been put on notice. Department of Justice put her on notice. 
there's clearly established case law. Her actions were willful. Why? Because it's on video. I got a three-minute video of her willful actions. Her will, willingness to violate someone's civil liberties. The video illustrates the obviousness standard of the actions, the discretion exercised by Sergeant Inman of the Richmond County Police Department's standard for violating one's civil liberties. But the problem is, if you're going at a case, and it's just relying on the obviousness standard, which is what happens when you're going based off of your feelings, you're relying on a judge's subjective perception of how bad a constitutional violation is. But here's the next part of that. There's a time and place for this. If you're doing this, there is a means of winning with the Iverson standard. Because this is where your story, which happens to be most people's complaint, they try to put their details, the devil's in the detail. This is where the devil needs to show up. This is where the monster needs to show out. Because the story comes into play. You are now playing up your situation and humanizing yourself with your audience. In this case, you need to find a mental relationship with the judge. You need to find a means of being relatable to the judge. This is not something that should be done in an affidavit at the start of your case. This is when you are having that one-on-one -on -one with the judge. When you're trying to exercise the obviousness standard. Now I'm going to give you one last story and I'm going to end today. Ten years ago. Well actually. Fifteen years ago I changed my name. Right. And the great part about it was. When I changed my name. I, I was in the chamber with the judge. And he was reading a book. And it was The Lincoln Lawyer. I, I actually kind of smiled. And I was like, hey, yeah, I just finished that one. And he goes, really? And I told him, he says, yeah. He says, hey, well, let's go eat lunch and talk about it. Hey, that's fine. So every Wednesday, we would get a book. And we'd read it throughout the week. we meet up every Wednesday you know, for lunch and we'll have like a book club meeting, kind of summarize the book. I, and what was funny was the fact that I didn't know at the time he was a head judge in Atlanta. But what also was funny was the fact that even during trial, we had a lunch. And I still kept my Wednesday appointment with that judge. We related because we had an affinity for knowledge. We wanted something more. So me telling a story, even humanizing myself, all the all the all the names that was being called in the paper, all the, the, the things that were being said about me. When in actuality, there was nothing more than I loved than the legal system. There was nothing more than I law loved than applying law. I even loved matching wits with someone who was a master chess player, which the judge was. And I used that even in the RICO trial. Because there are times in which your relatability needs to be something as simple as understanding your audience and then telling them the story they need to hear. And no matter what standards you're having or applying, that you know what story relates to you and what benefits 
your audience. 